I think we're good. I think we're good. So I'm going to share the screen again, and we'll kind of um, pick up where we left off. Okay. And so um, this is the the sutta on the simile of the elephant's foot that were we started last um, last session. And so I wanted I wanted to continue sort of slow reading this sutta because there's there's kind of so many interesting things to talk about, and so um, but let me just uh, let me just um, let you know that um, it'll just be me this week. Hosen um, isn't able to come, and so we'll just have the um, the discussion of the of the scriptures and maybe we can maybe we go a little bit longer with that this week we won't have a minute i won't try to guide you in a meditation um and this is our last session for this workshop so um uh we um well then just have to see when we can schedule another one the fall might be possible but since i'm teaching in the fall again um, it may not be until next spring, I think. And actually, this is something else I might we might discuss um, at the end of the session today, but sort of when would be the best time of year to have this and for how long and what rhythm. So let's kind of leave that discussion for the end. Um, and you know, also any other suggestions you might have about format. Um, so let's go back. Let's just let me just remind you of what this uh, what this discourse is about um remember at the beginning um a certain a brahmin named janu shoni or janu soni however you pronounce it encounters an ascetic named pilotika who has just come from the buddha and janu soni of course has heard a lot about the buddha and he asks pilotika do you really think he's enlightened? <laughs> uh, or, you know, sort of the, the way he puts it, is he fully awakened? Is he fully awakened? And is his, is his teaching, is his Dhamma well explained? And is his community practicing well? That's, that's the, the question. But I think the, the idea is, well, is he really enlightened? Is he really enlightened? Is he really awakened as people say he is? And, you know, we have this question today. Right, there's so many teachers out there, um, you know, and we want to know. Well, who, you know, which one should I follow? You know, I, um, whose student should I become? There's, there's Muji and there's Adya Shanti and there's this Roshi and that Roshi. And I remember in my day, so I started meditating back in the '60s, and at that time there was Maharishi and. Rajneesh, who, yet, who later became, became Osho, and there was Yogi Bhajan, and on and on and on. And sort of this was a topic of, of you know, that, that people um, discussed uh, to sort of spiritual seekers like me and my friends. Well, who is the one who is truly enlightened? Um, who, is a, who is a true guru? And so I think that's kind of the sense of the question here. There were so many teachers, as we know, back in the day of the Buddha. And so who is, who is the, the greatest um, of these teachers and which one um, should, I, should I follow? And so that's, that's, that's the spirit of John Nusoni's question. And Pilotika tells him, well, I can't really answer that because I'm not on his level, he says. Um, so I don't really know for sure, but um, the only way to I get the, the only way to tell whether someone is fully enlightened is by he says by following um, their footprints by following their footprints just like a hunter would follow the footprints of of an elephant that he finds in the jungle and by looking at these footprints and the size of the footprints he would know well this is a this is a big bull elephant. And so in the same way, we can only know um, that the Buddha, uh, that the, you know, the blessed one, he calls him, is fully, is a, is a fully enlightened Buddha from 
is footprints. And so what are those footprints? Well, for John Usoni, or I'm sorry, for Pilotica, they have to do with sort of how the Buddha presents himself, how he presents himself and how he engages with other people, especially people who come to him who want to challenge him and, um, and debate with him. And, and many times Pilotica has seen that these people come to the Buddha and they're just won over by him and they forget the questions they were going to ask him and they listen to his teaching and they want to become his followers. And so for him, that's, those, that's the footprint of the Buddha that tells him that he is indeed a fully enlightened Buddha. And um, so, so it's kind of interesting sort of uh, Pilotica's criterion um, how, you know, so this is something he's able to observe about the Buddha. He can't, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't know anything about his experience or his state of awareness, but he sees his conduct with other people and he, and he makes his judgment on that basis. Well, so John Osoni then goes to Buddha and, you know, you know, he's, of course, after hearing this from Pilotika, he's very eager to meet him and he goes to Buddha and he tells him what Pilotika said. And the Buddha says, well, okay, but those aren't the real footprints of a fully awakened Buddha. And so let me tell you what those are. And, um, and so the Buddha then begins to describe the path of practice. And this is the, this is the Eightfold Noble Path that's, that's presented in the first sermon as the fourth of the Four Noble Truths. Um, so he begins to um, talk about the different, the different stages of the Eightfold Noble Path. And he then basically um, identifies certain experiences that the, 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 that the monk or the, the, the Buddhist practitioner has along the path and suggest that these really are the footprints of the, um, of the Buddha. And so he, what he seems to be saying is that um, the real footprints of the Buddha are um, the experience, the experiences one that has, I'm sorry, the experiences that one has when practicing the path. These are the true signs of his enlightenment. The signs of the Buddha's, Buddha's enlightenment are the growth of your own enlightenment and your own awakening as you practice the path. And so this is a really a very, you know, a very you know, a different, um, you know, a different thing from what Pilotica is, is uh, focused on. And so this then presents Buddha with an occasion to explain in some detail the path. And that's really, that's why I've chosen the sutta to read together because it, it, gives, it gives a fairly complete, um, but yet at the same time, concise description of the Eightfold Noble Path. And so that's what we were, that's what we were starting to, to um, go through last time. You know, we, and we looked at right view, sort of this um, initial, um, uh, moment of faith or confidence in the Buddha, and then the, the, different, the, the different aspects of right conduct, um, right action, um, right thought, right speech. Um, so, you know, restraining, um, ref refraining from any kind of harm or violence to other, other living beings, uh, speaking truthfully, also um, speaking purposefully, these kinds of things. And then, then there are the more specific um, uh, prescriptions for monks, for people, sort of the, 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 the details of uh, the observances that, that um, monks have to follow, such as eating just once a day um, and then not, not enjoying any kind of luxury um, um, and so on and so forth. So, um, 
with, and so that's essentially we got we got to basically that point um, the last time. I'm trying to find I'm trying to find it in the in the text here. Um, here we have yes. Yeah, so here is the right. This paragraph here is the um, um, what's called right livelihood, and this is the way of life of of, of the monks. They avoid injuring plants and seeds. So not just animate beings, but also um, inanimate beings. They eat in one part of the day. They only eat once, um, abstaining from eating at night. They avoid dancing, singing music, seeing shows. They don't, they don't um, <clears throat> carry gold or money. Um, they really don't have any possessions at all. And they don't, um, have any real occupation. They avoid running errands and messages, buying and selling, um, um, bribery, fraud. Of course, they're not in, engaged in any kinds of these, these things, either, not to mention mutilation, murder, abduction, ban banditry, plunder, and violence. So, so um, but then it sort of really kind of summarizes the, the monastic um, um, way of life, I think, very beautifully in this paragraph. <clears throat> They're content with robes to look after the body and alms food to look after, look after the belly. Wherever they go, they set out taking only these things. They're like a bird. Wherever it flies, wings are its only burden. In the same way, a mendicant, a monk, is content with robes to look after the body and alms food to look after the belly. Wherever they go, they set out taking, oh, taking only these things when they have this spectrum of noble ethics, or another word, another translation here would be noble conduct, they experience a blameless happiness inside themselves. They experience a blameless happiness inside themselves. And he's going to repeat this phrase um, several times in the coming paragraphs. And so, when one, I mean, what he's saying here, and when one is perfected in right conduct, and for a monk, that means when one has um, perfected the, the um, conduct of a monk, then one experiences this inner kind of inner happiness, which is then really an validation of one's progress on the path. And he doesn't call this one of the footprints of the Buddha, but this is, the, he could have called this a, you know, a footprint. Of the, so this is a sign that one is growing in purification and awakening, and therefore a sign of, um, of the, um, of the enlightenment of the person who um, who designed this path of practice. So let me just stop here for a second, see if anybody has any questions or comments. This is about where we got last time. So do you have any questions that were left over from last session? Okay, anybody? And you can just unmute and start talking. And I'll know you have a question. Uh, all right. So that's so basically we've covered, I think, up to this point, four limbs of the path: um, right view, right thought, right speech, right action. Actually, five, and the right life, right liveliness, or right livelihood. Sorry, that's the the that's the monastic way of life. The, so the the way of life that monks observe as opposed to lay people, okay? There are certain rules, that other specific rules that lay people follow also. And then he comes to um, another practice, which I'll just read. Um, when they see a sight with their eyes, they don't get caught up in the features and details. If the faculty of sight were left unrestrained, bad, unskillful qualities of desire and aversion would become overwhelming. For this reason, they practice restraint, protecting the faculty of sight and achieving its restraint. And so that, that covers the faculty of sight. And then he says the same thing about 
the faculty of hearing, the faculty of smell, the faculty of taste, the, you know, and then the faculty of touch, and then also the mind. And so this practice is generally referred to as guarding the senses, guarding the senses. Um, but um, in, the, um, in the Noble Eightfold Path, it um, is referred to as right effort, right effort. And what he's talking about here is that when you're <clears throat> using the senses, which you're, do, of course, doing all the time, um, you don't get lost in the sensual qualities of the object. You just use the senses as needed. You don't get absorbed in the, in the, in the object. And perhaps that even means you don't savor it. You don't savor it. You don't notice how beautiful it is or how delicious it tastes or something like that. Um, you just, he says, you know, don't get, you don't get caught up in features and details, um, which can, um, um, which can stimulate desire or aversion. And so this is the practice of guarding the senses. And if you think about this, um, it's really, it, it strikes me as a very difficult kind of practice. It's basically, you are um, <clears throat> cutting yourself off from enjoyment of sense objects. You're simply using the senses to, to navigate the world, but not as a means of pleasure. And that's hard. That's, I think that's hard, for, that, that, that's hard for anybody and it's certainly, you know, and he doesn't say that this is something that just monks do. I mean, it seems like it's something, you know, that only a monk could do, but he doesn't specify that here. Um, it's perhaps something that, you know, right effort is something that lay people also, lay, lay practitioners also um, are supposed to practice at, um, you know, to some degree. Okay, but then he says, we, then we get the same refrain. When you have perfected this, when they have this noble sense restraint, okay, but we notice the word noble, noble comes up again. It's, it's, a, it's the quality of someone who is truly noble and good. When they have this noble restraint, they experience an unsullied bliss inside themselves. Okay, so now previously he talked about when you have perfected right conduct, you experience a blameless happiness inside yourself. But now when you have perfected guarding the senses or right effort, you experience an unsullied inside yourself. And once again, this is, this is a kind of validation that you're making progress on the path. Okay. Um, all right. So that is what's called right effort. And then there are actually two other. So we've talked about right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right, right effort. That's six of the limbs of the Eightfold Path. And there are two more. One is right mindfulness, and the last is right concentration or you know, it's translated different right meditation, okay? And here is where he mentions right mindfulness. Of course, we've all heard about mindfulness. Some of us probably practice mindfulness. It's a very popular form of Buddhist practice um, in the West today. And that's partly because there, 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 see, there are many excellent teachers of mindfulness under the, under the title Vipassana, Vipassana. Uh, the word vipassana is, I mean, is often translated it as mindfulness. And so here he just mentions um, one, one small part of mindfulness. Um, the the, the, the full-blown practice of mindfulness is described in another discourse, in the, the middle discourses, and that's the 10th discourse, um, which is called the Foundations of Mindfulness. And this, this 
this um, paragraph is actually um, is actually taken. You know, it's it can be found in that discourse, and so this is the practice of what's called situational awareness. Um, it's a kind of mindfulness. And so let me just read it. They, they act with situational awareness when going out and coming back, when looking ahead and aside, when bending and extending the limbs, when bearing the outer robe, bowl, and robes, when eating, drinking, chewing and tasting, urinating and defecating, when walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, walking, speaking, and keeping silent. So when you do th these things, you are aware um, of doing these things. You are present to what you are doing when you are doing it. That's really the, the root of all mindfulness practice, to be, be present in the moment and what's going on in your mind and body um, um, and in your, also your emotional states um, as it is occurring. So being brought here into the moment um, that's mindfulness. So this is this this paragraph is um, just a a reference to this practice, which, as I said, a much more much more elaborately described in in other discourses. Yeah. Okay. And um, then okay, so now you're ready to meditate. And mindfulness, you know, clearly the way he describes it here, mindfulness is a kind of practice, a kind of, you know, it's a kind of meditative practice that you engage in all the time, no, no matter what you're doing. But concentration is a practice that you, um, you engage, engage in only occasionally. You go to some secluded place, you prepare yourself for meditation, and then you go into a state of trance, or the word that, that's actually used in Buddhist text is samadhi, samadhi, which is the word that's also used in the Hindu yoga tradition, samadhi, samadhi, concentration. Um, so he continues, he says, when they have this noble spectrum of right conduct, this noble contentment, this noble sense restraint, this noble mindfulness and situ situational awareness, they frequent a secluded place, a wilderness or a secluded lodging, a wilderness, the root of a tree, a hill, a ravine, a mountain cave, a burial ground, a forest, the open air, a heap of straw. And then it says after the meals, so after they have returned from their alms round, their, their begging round, they sit down cross-legged, so there's reference to posture here, their body straight, and establish mindfulness there. And then um, it says, and this is kind of next part is very interesting because it talks about um, abandoning various attitudes, sort of kind of clearing your mind and your emotional state to prepare you for meditation, which is, I mean, it's interesting. So this is a very ancient, you have to understand, this is a very ancient description of meditation. And practices of meditation we learn today may not be like this at all. But this is, this, um, this next part is something that the Buddha always mentions as a preparation for um, deep meditation for concentration, the experience of samadhi. And um, this is um, traditionally referred to as eliminating the hindrances to meditation, eliminating the hindrances. And so there are five hindrances he mentions. First, one gives up desire for the world. Giving up desire for the world, they meditate with a heart rid of desire, cleansing the mind. So that's the first hindrance is sensual desire a desire for sensual, sensual pleasure. They give up, one gives up ill will and malevolence. So ill will is a hindrance to meditation. Next is dullness and drowsiness. So lethargy. Somehow you can, I've never been able to do this, but somehow you can just, just uh, 
you know, just throw that off, like taking off your sweater or something. Um, and so that, but that is certainly hindrance of meditation. That certainly makes sense. Uh, lethargy, sleepiness, then giving up restlessness and remorse. Okay, this is translated in different ways. Um, the one I like is worry and anxiety. And then finally, giving up doubts. That's the last hindrance. Doubt about what doubt, but you know, it doesn't say doubt, but it's really, you know, doubt about the Dhamma, you know, doubt about, you know, doubt about um, what one is about it to do and its effectiveness. So these are the five hindrances. And so when, before one meditates, one discards these somehow, sensual desire, malevolence, lethargy, worry and anxiety and doubt. And, um, and then he says, then he says, they give up these five hindrances, corruptions of the heart that weaken wisdom. So these are corruptions of the heart that weaken wisdom, then quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome or unskillful qualities, um, like, you know, um, negative emotions um, and other, you know, anger and ill will and those, these kinds of things, they enter and remain in the first absorption, okay, or the first stage of concentration which has the rapture and bliss born of seclusion while placing the mind and keeping it connected. Okay, so notice this is a, a fairly sort of almost technical description of the first state or the first stage of concentration. And there are various details here, sort of various features of it. You're secluded, you don't feel sensual desire. Um, you feel a kind of rapture and bliss born of seclusion not sure what that means, but then there's also some kind of mental focus. One places the mind and keeps it connected on, on what is an interesting question. That's not specified here, but some object, some, some appropriate object of the meditation, presumably, okay? And notice that this you know, meditation, of course, um, this, this description of, of a meditative state is not sufficient to know how to meditate. This is really just sort of a signpost for those who are practicing meditation. And I'm sure that in ancient times as well in modern times, meditation was taught um, through the instruction of a, of, of a teacher. Um, it's so someone, it teaches you some practice and um, you engage in that, and then um, at some point you will um, experience the state that he describes here in these sort of very generic terms. It may not very well be exactly exactly fit this description, but this is kind of like a like a signpost for those who are practicing meditation. So, but anyway, this is the first stage of concentration. And then this he says, and then he says, this is a footprint of the realized one. Um, but just because one has seen this footprint, a noble disciple wouldn't yet come to the conclusion. The blessed one is fully awakened. The Buddha, the teaching is well explained, the Sangha is practicing well. So this is, he says, this is a footprint. This is a mark or so this, this your own experience of, of blissful concentration in meditation is, um, is a, this is, this is the first thing he mentions as a real footprint. So a real indication of the Buddha as a fully realized being. And why is that? Because it's, it's an experience, it's sort of the first experience of your own awakening in meditation. Um, This is, um, and if, if you have any questions um, or comments, just speak up and I'll, um, I'll uh, switch to you. There are, there are many, many much more 
elaborate descriptions of the stages of meditation in other texts. And here I've gone to um, <clears throat> another one. This is, um, see if I, here we go. This is a much longer, this is from a, um, from one of the a discourse from the, from the book of long discourses. But notice this is, this is, so this is, um, maybe we'll just go back to 74. So let's just start reading here. The bhikkhu, so long as these five hindrances are not put away with him, looks upon himself as in, no, as in debt, in disease, in prison, and so forth, in slavery, lost on a desert road. But when these five hindrances have been put away, he looks upon himself as freed from debt, rid of disease, out of jail, free, a free man and secure. And gladness springs up within him on his realizing that. And joy arises in him, gladdened as he is. And so rejoicing, all his body becomes at ease. And being at ease, he is filled with a sense of peace. And in that peace, his heart is stayed. His heart is content. Then estranged from desires or free from desires, aloof from evil dispositions, he enters into and remains in the first stage of meditation, a state of joy and ease born of detachment, reasoning and investigation going on at the same time. So this is, this is another, this is actually just a different translation of the passage that we just read. Um, um, this one here, they give up these five hindrances, then secluded from sensual pleasures, from unskillful qualities, they enter and remain in the first state of a trance or meditation, which has rapture and bliss born of seclusion while placing the mind and keeping it connected. So that's, this is just a never, so instead of placing the mind and keeping it connected, we have reasoning and investigation. Okay, so there is some mental activity going on in this first stage of trance. And then, but what I, the reason I wanted to look at, at this version is because it describes the, 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 the happiness that arises from the state of trance with a beautiful metaphor. So he goes on, this, his very body, does he so pervade, drench, permeate, and suffuse with the joy and ease born of detachment there that there is no spot in his whole frame, not suffused with it. Just as a skillful bathman or his apprentice will scatter perfumed soap powder in a mental basin and then besprinkling it with water drop by drop, will knead it together um, that the ball of lather taking up the moisture is drenched with it, pervaded by it, permeated by it within, and without, and there is no leakage possible. This is an immediate fruit of the life of the ascetic. So he's, this is a different dialogue. The Buddha is talking about a king and the king is asking, what are, the, what are the fruits of the ascetic life? What are the benefits? What do you get out of it? And so he gives this beautiful description of a state of, you know, of, of bliss or happiness that arises in meditation. And of course, the thing we want to note here is that Buddha is talking about happiness. He's talking about happiness, um, but not, a, a, not happiness that comes from the enjoyment of sensual pleasures, but a kind of um, a, a higher kind of happiness that is attained in meditation. And so he says, this is, this is a footprint of the realized one. This is a, a, a footprint of the Buddha's enlightenment that you are able to attain that in meditation. Okay. And, um, all right. So then it continues. Um, he talks about then three other stages of meditation. So three other 
um, they're here in this text, it, they're translated as absorptions. There's a second absorption. There's a <clears throat> third absorption and so on. There's a fourth absorption. So there are four, there are four basic stages of, of um, concentration and they all have you know, different descriptions. They have different, you know, different features so that um, they're, you know, they're, they're distinct kinds of experiences um, or they're, but they're all also stages of, of, of concentration or samadhi. So it's like samadhi comes in different flavors with different aspects to it. And so as one meditates, one progresses through these different samadhis. Now, I never really quite um, um, been able to make up my mind um, about whether Buddha is talking about stages of meditation that happen in one meditation or stages that was sort of sort of plateaus of practice that when that one reaches over time um, in the practice of meditation. Um, I've never seen any kind of definitive discussion of this, but um, anyway, um, so he calls all of these stages of meditation footprints of the, of the, of the realized one. So these, these are the experiences that indicate the enlightenment of the teacher who defined this path, this path of practice. So as I said, said before, your growth in enlightenment is the, the sort of the proof of the Buddha's enlightenment. That's really kind of the message he's, 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 he's emphasizing in this, in this teaching to John Masoni. And part of the teaching is, well, so you have to, you have to actually practice to know who the Buddha is. You have to practice. It's not, it's not just enough to be impressed with um, how clever he is and how he wins people over. And it's not enough to just sit in his presence and be amazed and, um, and uh, it's kind of bathe in his, bathe in his, um, in, in his presence. You have to practice. You have to practice yourself. So it's through your own effort that you um, become awakened, and then you realize you realize that the Buddha is awakened. Okay, but I have a comment, John. It, can I speak? Can I can I ask you uh, a question? Please, uh, yes, please, please. <clears throat> I was curious. <clears throat> what, from my understanding, from the Satipana Sutra, that. When he's talking about these absorptions, he's talking about the jhanas. You know that term jhanas? That's what he's talking. That's what he's talking about here. Yeah, right. The absorptions, there's a first, second, third, and the fourth. Fourth is a big deal, apparently. That's where you really get the benefits and the real experience of uh of a, some kind of what we would call in Japanese Buddhism, Satori or a basic or early awakening um, in the, when you get to the fourth jhana, but he seems like he's covering it, right? Getting it on the tail end of it right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so these are, these are, these are the jhanas. Yeah. Um, and um, the Sanskrit word is dhyana, D-H-Y-A-N-A. -A. That's, <clears throat> that's also a term um, of, that's used in the Hindu yoga tradition, so dhyana. And um, so in Pali, it becomes jhana. And the important thing to know is that these are, these are states of samadhi, where samadhi is, a, is um, I would say, a diminishing of mental activity where thought, thought progressively becomes um, less and less pronounced until one is in a state. I mean, in, in yoga, it's described as a state of just pure consciousness, pure consciousness, whereas one is simply, one is conscious, um, um, but not conscious of anything. But, the, the, but still, you know, 
with that in mind, it's still interesting to look at these different descriptions of the different samadhis, the, the diff different yams, because they all have, you know, in, in, this, in this tradition, they have different features. As I would say, they have different flavors. So it's not just pure consciousness. And there's, there's you know, there are different ones. There's, you know, the first one and the second one and the third one and so forth. And um, so, and this is also a sort of a, an abbreviated um, uh, an account because in, there's a fuller account that, in, that includes four states of, medita of meditation beyond these first four. So these are, these, these four that he mentions here are called the, um, the states of meditation with form. But then beyond these, there are four formless meditations. And so, so you get different versions of, of, you know, the, of the practice of meditation in the scriptures. Which one did you say that was, John? Which, uh, it goes into the last four? Um, I think there are many, there are many scriptures, many suttas, discourses oh, okay. that, that um, talk about the, you know, the four formless meditations and yeah. Um, so, um, but notice that, notice the next thing that happens. Okay, this is, this is what's really interesting to me, or I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, one of many, many really interesting things in this discourse. So you've reheated, now you've reached the fourth samadhi. When their mind has become immersed in samadhi, like this purified, bright, flawless, rid of corruptions, impurities, I guess, pliable or flexible, workable, steady, and imperturbable. So an interesting description of the mind. When the mind has become like this, they extend it toward recollection of past lives. They reckon, recollect many kinds of past lives. That is one, two, three, four, five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 1,000, 100,000 rebirths. Many eons of the world contracting, many eons of the world expanding, many eons of the world contracting and expanding. They recollect their many kinds of past lives with the future features and details. This too is called a footprint of the realized one. So when one has reached the highest stage of meditation, one is able to, re he uses the word recollect, to recall one's past life. So we, one remembers all of one's past lives or not all of them because they're, you know, they're countless, but many, many past lives. And, um, and so how do you do that? I mean, what's that, what's that like anyway, to remember 100,000 past lives in meditation? Um, it obviously implies some significant expansion of consciousness, almost a kind of omniscience. But what's interesting is that the Buddha thinks that this vision or this recollection of one's past lives is essential, is essential to awakening. It's part of the path, it's, it's, it's what meditation culminates in. And then after that, um, well, and then he says that this, this too is called a footprint of the Buddha. Um, after that, then one has a, a sort of a vision of the cycle of rebirth for every, for all living beings. So one doesn't just recollect one's, one's own past lives, but we, one would sees for all living beings, um, how someone is born, um, lives for a certain period of time, performing certain karma, how they are then um, reborn as a result of that karma. And one sees this, not just for oneself now, but for all, he says for all beings. When the mind, when their mind has become immersed in samadhi like this, 
They extend it toward knowledge of the ending of the file. We've got, it's the previous paragraph. When their mind becomes immersed in samadhi, they extend it toward knowledge of the death and rebirth of sentient beings. With clairvoyance that is purified and surpasses the human, they under, understand how sentient beings are reborn according to their deeds. This too is called a footprint of the realized one. So one has, a, I don't know, I guess it's, it, it's like one has a vision of the workings of karma universally. Which suggests almost a kind of omniscience. Um, and um, that um, is also extraordinary. This is also, he seems to be suggesting, essential to awakening. It's like, you know, we think that when you are truly wise, when you're truly awakened, you should know why everything is the way it is. Right? Why is everything the way it is? And certainly part of the answer to that question is knowing the law of karma. The law of karma determines why people are the way they are, why they're experiencing what they're experiencing, um, why you are the way you are, why you are experiencing what you are experiencing and what you've experienced in the past. So one sees this, this is, this is an essential step on the way to awakening in this, in this path. Um, and then finally, okay, so that's another footprint. So that's again, that's, this is another validation of one's progress on the path toward awakening. And then finally, um, when the mind, so the mind samadhi purifies the mind, it, clarifies the mind, it expands the mind so that one able, is able to have these experiences. Then with the mind um, purified, clarified, expanded and so forth, one directs one's attention to, says the ending of the defilements, but then, the, um, but then to the Four Noble Truths. They truly understand this is suffering this is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering. So that's a realization of the Four Noble Truths. These are the, once again, the truths that he presented in the first sermon. And so when you understand the Four, four Noble Truths, then one also understands that the defilements what the defilements are and that the defilements have, um, that this is the practice that leads to the cessation of the defilements, okay? What are these defilements? These are kind of the, the I don't know what you call them, the sort of the, the basic, the, 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 the root of all weaknesses and bad tendencies. Those are the, they're the three defilements of, once again, sensual desire and then, what he calls desire for existence. So just the desire to exist is one of the roots of all weakness and bad tendencies. And then the final of, of the three is ignorance. And so what he's saying here is that at the end, ultimately, it's, so this, this whole, this, this practice of meditation culminates in a realization of the Four Noble Truths and a realiza realization of what the defilements are. And then finally, that one is free from these defilements of sensual desire to be reborn and, and ignorance. And when they're freed, they know they're freed. So the last step is to realize that one has overcome these weaknesses that keep one bound up in the cycle of samsara. And then one has this realization. They understand rebirth has ended. The spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. There's no return to any state of existence. And so this was the realization that the Buddha had upon his enlightenment. One realizes that 
essentially that one will not be uh, born again. One has escaped from the cycle of rebirth. One has escaped from suffering. And he says, this is called a footprint of the realized one. And then he says, finally, at this point, one has come to the conclusion, the blessed one is a fully awakened Buddha. The teaching is well explained, the Sangha is practiced well. Um, and at this point, the simile of the elephant's put has been, has footprint has been completed in detail. So now one doesn't just see the footprint of the Buddha, but, or, but one is able to conclude from one's own awakening that the Buddha is a fully awakened, or that the blessed one, or the Gautama Buddha is a fully awakened Buddha. So based on one's own awakening, one is able to conclude that's the last footprint, one's own awakening. And from that, one is able to conclude that the Buddha was fully awakened. Now, the last kind of interesting thing to notice about this is that one still is still concluding here that the Buddha is um, a fully awakened teacher um, from something else. So one is drawing an inference one is not on the same level as the Buddha himself. That seems to be an implication here. But from, from your own awakening, you infer his awakening, but you do not comprehend his awakening. Of course, this, is, this was something that was emphasized throughout the Buddhist tradition, that the Buddha's awakening is truly incomprehensible. It's much, great, it's much greater than any awakening that we're able to achieve in our practice. So the, the, the Buddha has laid all this out for John Usoni. And then John Usoni is kind of overjoyed. He's kind of gushing with uh, praise and admiration. And he says, excellent master, ex excellent master Gotama, excellent, as if he were writing the overturned or revealing the hidden, or pointing out the path to the lost, or lighting a lamp in the dark so people with good eyes can see what's there. Master Gotama has made the teaching clear in many ways. I go for refuge to Master Gotama, to the teaching and to the Sangha. From this day forth, may Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge for life. Okay? So... So he says, I mean, he says here something like, um, I, mean, I don't know how to interpret this exactly, but it's sort of like, this has um, clarified everything for me. I get it. This is, uh, this makes total sense to me. And, um, and, the, and I have confidence now in this teaching so that I, um, would like to become a disciple, a lay disciple. No, so not a monk, but a lay follower of the Buddha. And he will remain a householder because he's a wealthy, we, we've learned at the beginning, he's a wealthy Brahmin. He has many responsibilities. And for another thing, he can donate a lot of money to the, to, to the, the Sangha. And so um, maybe you don't want him to become a monk. <laughs> But um, anyway, that's what he, that's his declaration. So that's his sort of realization. He has um, been enlightened enough to make this commitment, okay? But notice also that he doesn't become awakened himself as a result of hearing, hearing this teaching, as is the case um, for other peoples. In other, in other discourses. The Buddha delivers a teaching. You remember the first sermon? He, he delivered the teaching to the, five, to the five ascetics. And one of them, I can't, I forget the name, becomes awakened just from hearing the first sermon. But this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen to John Asoni. But he is, he is um, enlightened enough to make this commitment to become a follower. Okay, questions, yeah, yeah. Frank, you always have something.
you're muted. <laughs> I'm glad you clearly displayed this. And it is very motivational for me. It, you know, it always gives me a sense of clarity when I review these and, and put myself in some perspective of how my practice has been. Um, I really appreciate it. I want to try to find some more depth on the fourth jhana somewhere. I, I, I know I have some texts that have it, but this always gets me want to get back to that. Uh, there's a bhikkhu that came to the Theosophical Society and he spoke of uh, emptiness in the fourth jhana and some mm -hmm. of these other stages of meditation and I really appreciate um, and I hope to go through this before we meet again <clears throat> in either the fall. I hope you don't go to next spring, John. I would like to see us do it in the fall if possible. And I'd be willing to co-facilitate it if you needed to because of some tasks that got in the way for you to do it. But I'd be willing to do that as a stand-in to help mm -hmm. keep us going in the fall. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really think this is important to keep this perspective. Uh, and that, as everybody else pretty much said this weekly, I believe too, I want to, with my practice at this time, I feel like I need to keep consistent application. Plus, it was hard for me to keep track of what weeks we met. <laughs> yeah, this was that last week? Was that next week? <laughs> it's every yeah. week that I know it, every yeah. Saturday. Yeah. Me, me too. So, me too. You know how it is. Yeah. Okay. But thank you for that. And, uh, and I really appreciate other people's diligence too around this that we can maybe keep this going mm -hmm. at the at uh, Bodhi, you know. This. Mm -hmm. Well, thank okay. you. Okay, good. Um, anyone else? Any any questions? That any kind of anything seem puzzling or unusual or you know um, strange even um, in this in this discourse? That um, um, was it, um, yeah, puzzling in any way. Um, uh, one thing that was a little puzzling, I guess, to me was the in right effort. Uh, it you referred to a noble sense restraint, mm -hmm. and in the discussion there was a reference of um, tasting. Mm -hmm. and as a part of right mindfulness mm -hmm. so you're engaging your sense of taste but it's and it's part of your mindfulness but what do you suppress it do you suppress the the value like oh this tastes good or mm -hmm. i want more of this or yeah how does that work maybe you know I, that's i think taste is a good example but maybe you kind of um you know how you if you're um tasting a piece of chocolate cake and you notice all the flavors and how beautifully they blend together and you're also kind of your your um critical faculty kicks in right you think oh this is the mm -hmm. best cake i've ever had or you know mm -hmm. or actually the one i had last week was slightly better than this but this is really you know you're kind of you're really sort of zeroing in on the details, you know, the, the details, and you get caught in these details, it kind of sucks you in. The mm -hmm. obvious, the sensory objects pulls you in and you sort of lose yourself in this sensory object. And he says that, the, you know, he's saying that the, the danger of that is that away, it awakens desire, mm -hmm. you know, with this, with this, with this fuller appreciation, you know, you, um, it's, you know, that's what awakens desire and, and makes you want, you know, more chocolate cake, you know, you know, sometime in the near future. And so that's, um, I think that's what he's talking about. And of course, this is that, you know, we're taught, we're taught, we're actually taught to do this. We're actually taught to enjoy and savor and appreciate things and to, and to um, you know, experience them critically. And that's why I think this, this practice is a really hard one because I think he's telling you to turn that off. Mm -hmm. 
because that's what pulls that's what pulls you in and that's what feeds desire and remember you know we remember you know in the four in the four noble truths desire the second truth says that desire is the cause of suffering desire is what keeps you caught up in life and makes you so you desire of course we desire these these um specific sensual pleasures that we become attuned to that are our favorite things of course we desire those but we even just desire to live to exist in order to experience those things and that's really the that's what really keeps us that's what causes us to be reborn this desire to exist again you're not done you want more enjoyment, more satisfaction. That's what causes rebirth. But the thing is, is that all the, this, this world of desire and enjoyment is, is but it says is really um, bottom line, a world of suffering. John, you know, I, I focus on the word restraint, which mm -hmm. doesn't mean elimination. It means holding it back. Um, and it's really easy to slip into the, the elimination side of it. But if you're restraining a wild elephant, the, the monkey mind, whatever, it's still there. Mm -hmm. It's just you recognize it for what it is. You recognize that it's not long-term satisfaction. It doesn't say get rid of it completely and eliminate it. So no. that kind of helps me because otherwise I find all this... Uh, it, 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 these four jhanas increase my doubt <laughs> that I'll ever get there and hopelessness. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Like saying, oh yeah, and I'll climb Mount Everest. And I'm going to run a couple of marathons in a row too. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why I thought. You know, you know, many people must be feeling that this is this is kind of discouraging. You know, how could I possibly do this? This is just too hard. This is I'm just looking out my window right now, and it's beautiful. It's green and all that. I don't want that pleasure to go away. Now, if I make that like a god, and I go too far with the pleasure, and I think it means more than it means, yeah, there is something beautiful about that. Then just don't get restrained. Yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. Acknowledge it, restrain it, and mm -hmm. get caught with it. Is how I like to think of it. Yeah. No. Of I... I'm not enlightened either, so maybe. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think that's that's very well put. I think a lot of people feel that way. I mean, it's something I struggle with. I struggle with this about Buddhism. It, you know, it's um, it's, you know, is it is Buddha telling us that we can't enjoy life at all? We have to. Sometimes it really seems that he is. And um, and then, you know, but what he's, you know, that I think the, um, you know. I, I think his um, idea is that, well, you can't have these, you know, sensual pleasures, but there are these higher non-sensual pleasures that you experience in meditation that, um, that you can look forward to. And maybe, and maybe actually, it's when you begin to experience these higher delights that you actually um, become less interested in the sensual because there's some other there's some other source of contentment and delight you know that describes these meditations there's this bliss this rapture this this equanimity this peace you know this you know the the soap powder get, that gets kneaded into a, a ball and is, is so fragrant and it's permeating everything i mean there are these very beautiful elaborate descriptions of you know i mean that the point is is that this is something um much um more enjoyable than anything that we could um in, you know encounter through sense experience so that's the let's that's like the consolation I, I, i'm glad you brought that up because what I was real, uh, realizing from this was the practice of bare attention is that when you see this, you align more with bare attention, less with the pleasure experience, the sensation of pleasure, but
but you st you're still aware of it, but you're not hooked by it. Mm -hmm. So you're more okay. aligned with bare attention, which is a meditative state of mind. Yeah, very good. But that doesn't mean the pleasure is not there. Exactly. Yeah. So you could be experiencing pleasure, but maybe maybe there's a um, a method to um, experience pleasure um, without being um, attached to it. Yeah. That's Not, it. Yeah. Non-attached experience of pleasure. So. <laughs> that gives us hope. <laughs> gives us hope. <laughs> that, we, that we might be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, it's, it's, sometimes it's, it's, you, know. <laughs> you know once again i guess you know the other thing you know i mentioned this um earlier but you know these are very ancient texts you know they go back to third fourth century bc or you know even earlier and um so they're um i don't know it's it's um a system that was designed for people living at that time and maybe, you know, I mean, this is a, a question about you know, any spiritual teaching. Maybe we have to adapt it to our time, you know, our situation. So that's um, also something to consider. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Okay. Susan, you've you have been quiet the whole workshop. I want you, but but also very attentive. I was wondering if you have any thoughts. <laughs> oh my God, I know. Well, it's it's all um, very new to me, and so I don't have a lot of background mm -hmm. in the philosophy of all of this. So I'm just absorbing it in the moment, being in the present. Um, yeah, I would just need more. You know, I need to just explore this more before i could have any questions maybe i don't know okay that's fine very good yeah i mean it, what was like one thing i was going to say is um i don't know the idea that um that that your whole entire existence is really just not to exist is that it i mean it's like this mm -hmm. earthly existence yeah. You have to get you have to get over this desire to exist. Because beyond this existence is really where you're you're trying to get to. Something beyond this. Like this is a testing ground or something. These are all just tests and you have thousands of lives. Mm -hmm. And you still can't figure it out. Right. You have thousands of lives to get, get kind of get tired and fed up with it. <laughs> uh, so that hundreds of thousands so so that then, then you finally lose this desire to exist and then you can move i think it's, it's beautiful what you said because that's really the there's you move on to something else and but buddha says hey, we can't talk about that we have no way of talking about it but there is something beyond this and that's really where we want to get and so he experienced that through years and years of through this through the meditation experience this inner realization of something way beyond the human life that's right you knew it was there but you can't define it like you just understand it at some level if you say yeah, your experience, experience that, or that's what that's what you become that's what you become he says you can't you know there, there are other I mean, you know next workshop we could look at some of these texts where he talks about Nirvana and um you know where he talks about you know um well he talks about how we can't talk about it but he actually says he actually gives quite a bit of information about it mm, okay uh, yeah so that would be that would be something a place to begin next time okay well, John, you, know, you were talking about um how this was in the you know second third fourth century bc and making the modern translation. And I just happened to uh, recently run into Joseph Goldstein podcasts where he's going through the five hindrances and the Satipatthana Sutra. Mm. And he does a really nice job of taking this text, which I've always found a little bit off-putting and putting it into 
terms that I can relate to more. So I'd recommend his podcast for anyone who's interested. They're just, they're very clear. They're, they're both studious, but, but practical and <laughs> down to earth at the same time and very accessible, I think. Excellent. I'll have a look at that. What can you give us some identifiers? How do we Google that? <clears throat> well, that's Joseph Goldstein podcast. I'm going to have to take a look at what site I go to for those. Yeah. Okay. I think if you put it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's through the, uh, uh, what was his name? Ram Dass's, uh Lama Foundation. Yeah, it's it's somehow attached to to that. I can I can get you the citation if you're interested. He's part of the Insight Meditation Society. Oh yeah, he's one yeah. of the founders. Exactly. Yes, he's great. There's yeah. also things on you can get you can get buy those from uh, Sounds True. They have a whole interpretation of that he has a new book that came out last year on meditation too joseph goldstein does yeah you don't have to buy these so these are uh right pad podcasts yeah they're just online deb says she's found one online what where joseph yeah, the yeah, there, are podcasts there, are, there are lots on there are lots on youtube right if you just go to joseph goldstein podcast the first thing that comes up, at least in serious suggestions, is Inside Our Podcast Archives, Be Here Now Network. Yeah. And that's that's what I've been listening to. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Good. That's a great that's a great resource. Cause I I think he's you know, he's certainly um a um very well, you know, he's very highly respected and certainly knows what he's talking about, very well qualified. Um, teacher so that would be that's a good recommendation like i say i just like the accessibility of it somehow it's in terms that sink in a little bit more than the buddha's own words will <laughs> yeah yeah um all right well let's 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 talk a little bit about sort of continuing how we would continue um and i guess um what is the what is the best time of year to have to have the workshop or do you want you know of course all of this is contingent on um on the support of the bodhi because i think we want we still want to um, have it through the bodhi the bodhi Munda Zen center um but just um do you have any suggestions about what time of year would work best for the workshop? Would it be fall or spring or winter? Um, I think summer Summer is, I mean, we're getting into summer now and people get busy going on vacation. You know, they're not, they're, they're not um, always at home, you know, um, by their computers, whatever. So do you have, do you have any, any suggestions or proposals? And I take it that every week, you know, every week would be better than every other week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably, Deb, Deb agrees with that. Um, what I, I thought actually, I mean, I, I meant, mentioned winter, I, I mean, the, the fall will be difficult for me because I'm, I'll be and then I'll also be in the middle of the semester. I'll be, um, I'll be going, hopefully, be going to Europe um, to work on a project, and then, then I come back, and um, then we get into the holidays. Um, so, you know, October, November might be possible, I suppose. Um, um, it just depends on, on how much I have on my plate at that time. But I also thought that early, you know, the, you know, the dead of winter after Christmas, after the holidays, like starting in February or even in late January, February and March, when there's really not a whole lot of other stuff going on and we all need kind of something to pick us up and keep our minds engaged, might be a good time to do it again. Okay. 
All right. And then what about, do you have any other suggestions about format or content of, of this? I mean, how do we, how do we go about that? I'm really very flexible. One thing I thought we could do next time, if, you know, if, if actually people come back and it's more like an intermediate level, then I could ask some of you to bring discourses to the session. You could find ones that you want to discuss and introduce them. And we could have, we could have you guys actually um, looking things up and um, yeah, and sharing them. Um, the other thing I want, I guess the other thing I want to emphasize is, you know, what I talked about at the beginning, maybe I'll close with this. And that is that the, the really the purpose of this workshop was to introduce you to the Buddhist scriptures um, and to show you how you can access them for yourselves. And, um, and so I would encourage you to take advantage of that. So you're now, you're now familiar with this website, Sutta Central. And for me, for me, it's a regular practice. I, you know, I try to read a, a discourse every day. There are longer ones and shorter ones. And, um, and these, the, the different books of the discourses are organized in different ways so that you can, you can, you can select um, chapters that are on specific topics and just go through the discourses on that topic. And so I encourage you, you know, between now and the next time we meet or that we have a, a workshop to really actually begin reading them on your own and seeing, um, you know, just, just seeing what kind of experience you have doing that. I, f I find it very rewarding. And remember that also on that website, there is a, there's a lot of background. There are a lot of, as you know, background essays on um, their study guides. There's a history of Buddhism, um, um, essays on the, you know, the um, history of the literature and, and, you know, how it came into existence, how it's organized. So I encourage you, I encourage you to make full use of this website. Okay. So thank you. Any, anything else? All right, then I wish Thanks, you Scott. well. Okay. Yeah, I wish you well. Have a great summer and I hope to see you, you know, possibly in the fall, but um, maybe sometime next year. Thank All you, right. John. Okay. Thank you. I have one question. So, how will you contact us? Like through email or through or um, post? Probably, probably both email and um, post and newsletter. Newsletter. Yeah. But we, we have uh -huh. your. Sorry, certainly, if we do it again, we have yeah. the email, you'll get an email from us. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you so much. All Thank right. you. Okay. Thank you. John. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.